Welcome to this evening's Spark Your Health program with Dr. Lee Edinger, better known as Dr. Herbivore. My name is Katira Noviello Kapoor, and I am the Senior Director of Health Promotion, Wellness, and Athletics at the 92nd Street Y. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Ettinger to our virtual stage to support families in boosting their confidence in the kitchen when it comes to plant-based meal planning. We hope to see you for upcoming Spark Your Health talks, such as Living Well with Stress and Trauma with Dr. Alyssa Appel, Dr. Gaber Mate, and Dr. Daniel Siegel tomorrow at 7 p.m. I am pleased to announce that Dr. Ettinger will be joining us on site at 92NY in April for an interactive two-day workshop on plant-based nutrition as well. We will leave at least 15 minutes at the end of the event for questions, so please feel free to enter your questions into the chat throughout the duration of tonight's program. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Lee Ettinger, graduated from Tufts University School of Medicine in 1998 and then continued his education in pediatrics and pediatric nephrology. I'm actually going to bring you onto screen now. Um, he worked at Hackensack University Medical Center for 16 years, treating serious childhood diseases. In 2021, he turned his focus to wellness and prevention by founding the Dr. Herbivore New York and New Jersey telemedicine practice to teach families how to thrive on the plant-based diet. Welcome, Dr. Ettinger. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you to the 92nd Street Y for having me here for this presentation tonight. I'm going to go and share my screen. Uh, while I'm doing that, I'll start with a joke. Is that um, so? I met this woman on the street the other day, and she said she recognized me from an online vegan forum, but I had never met her before. Hmm. So let me start by saying just a quick medical disclaimer that while I am a gray hair doctor, I'm not your gray hair doctor. This presentation is for information purposes only. I'll be talking about plant-based family nutrition done right. First, some definitions. Let's talk about the whole foods plant-based diet. This diet emphasizes whole minimally processed foods, avoids animal products. All the calories eaten are from plants. And really that's the theme is that we really don't need the animals. We can get everything we need from the plants. We don't need them to go through the animals. The whole foods plant-based way of eating excludes refined foods like added sugars and processed oils. Now I wanna differentiate that from the vegan who seeks to exclude all uses of animals by humans, including for food, clothing, entertainment, animal testing. Now I might say my belt is vegan, but I wouldn't really call it whole foods plant-based because like, I'm not gonna eat my belt. Um, likewise, there are some foods that are accidentally vegan like Coca-Cola and Oreos and Doritos. Um, these foods are vegan, but not necessarily part of the whole foods plant-based diet, which aims to kind of exclude those highly processed foods. You might have been hearing about vegan in New York City in the news. Like, for example, about a year ago, Mayor Adams, who's a strong proponent of the vegan diet, the plant-based diet, um, he entered Vegan Fridays into the curriculum, into the curriculum, into the cafeteria, uh, which I heard didn't go over so well and was quite a, uh, a shock when it rolled out, but uh, has been going better. Then you might have heard last summer, this made the national news in Florida, um, one mom's vegan diet was thought to contribute to her toddler starving to death. And we really want to avoid that. I'm glad you're here tonight. We're going to talk about ways to make sure that the vegan diet is done right for a toddler or a young child. Now, that was in last July. And just a few days after that, it looked like the Wimbledon was uh, being uh, the top male tennis players. Uh, first and second place were both vegan. So that was very nice message in the in the world news about veganism and the plant-based diet it makes it sound quite appealing. Um, in other news, back in December, this was very exciting for doctors in New York City. They're going to get a six-hour free uh, CME continuing medical education course where they're going to learn about the plant-based diet and other lifestyle medicine information uh, for free, six hours uh, that uh, they can partake in. I don't know if that's rolled out yet. I do know one of the uh, creators of one of the hours of content, and I asked her if there was any pediatrics in that course. And unfortunately, it sounds like there, there's not going to be. It's focused on adult 
medicine. And I was like, put me in coach. I, I got I got a hard drive full of pediatric uh, lectures and information, uh, but maybe I'll get in the next round, hopefully. But uh, if you are a doctor listening to this, or you know a doctor, or you're family doctor, your pediatrician, uh, please let them be aware that this will be available to them if it's not already. Now, it is the position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, a very respected national organization, that the plant-based diet, the vegan diet, is when appropriately planned, and I'm going to be helping you how to do that, is appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescence, older adulthood, and for athletes. And they do make a note of um, that you need a source of vitamin B12, and I'll talk about that later. So the first problem that we want to avoid on the plant-based diet is avoiding a calorie deficiency. And uh, we have an expression in pediatrics that uh, you only get one chance to grow. Uh, by the time you're a teenager and your growth plates fuse, uh, you're not gonna get any more growth. So it's really important the first few years of life to set yourself up for meeting your adult potential height. So uh, growing children, we need to make sure that they're not in a calorie deficit, that they're not getting inadequate calories on the plant-based diet. So we can think about food on this spectrum, and this is the energy density theory by uh, registered dietitian Jeff Novick. And you can put all your foods on the spectrum from left uh, calories per pound of zero with fiber and water, and then you have all these plants over here with very low calorie density. For example, your leafy green salads, vegetables and fruits, starches, and then some more fatty plants like avocados and uh, nuts and soy products. Then we move over into the higher calorie density food, which are the animal products, dairy, high fructose corn syrup, uh, fried foods. Uh, this is kind of where the typical standard American diet is desserts and chocolate, and then the highest calorie density food is over here with oil, uh, butter, or fat. And in general, people eat about two to four pounds of food per day, a child might eat less. So you wanna be especially careful that if a child's eating less and they're eating too far to the left on this calorie density scale, they might get inadequate calories. A lot of people make what I call the salad mistake when they first start the plant-based diet and uh, they hear the word diet, or maybe they are trying to lose some weight uh, or control their weight. And they have the mentality that, oh, a diet, I should be eating less. And they make very small salads and they're way over here at the left side of the spectrum and eating a small salad. And they're really only getting maybe a few hundred calories uh, per meal or per day even, and they're feeling weak and tired, and uh, the plant-based diet is not suiting them. They don't have the energy and the, the, uh, the thriving on this way of eating. So please don't make the salad mistake. And then we have to be especially uh, careful, like I said, with kids with their smaller stomachs uh, that fill up quickly, especially with the high fiber and high water content of the plants, of the whole plants. Uh, we have to make sure that we're not uh, uh, restricting them in calories in any way. So for example, you might look at this sandwich and uh, I can plot it out on the spectrum and say, okay, you know, the whole gray bread is around here. Uh, the leafy green salad and onions and tomato are here. And then over further to the right is the deli meat and the cheese. And if I wanna make this into a more plant-based sandwich, then the whole gray bread is here, no more animal products and all the other ingredients uh, are over here with all the, the veggies, non-starchy veggies. So you can see that I've slid the sandwich over to the left. And even though it might be the same weight of sandwich, uh, the calorie density is so much less and a child might get too little calories. So this is why I recommend for the growing child, especially if there are not weight concerns, maybe you wanna use some soy products uh, uh, tofu, tempeh kind of things in the sandwich, or some nut butters in the sandwich, or even, uh, I know this is controversial, but some of the, the um, plant-based meat products or plant-based cheese products, or even be cooking with uh, some of the oils or butters or things like that, just to ensure that the child is getting adequate calories to grow. All right. Um, as soon as I start taking about talking about taking out the animal products, of course, the question is raised, well, what about a protein deficiency? We're going to do a deep dive into protein because I know that's a big concern for a lot of people, uh, especially when they go plant-based um, 
Uh, my even my with my kids at their pediatrician, their pediatrician's asking them, well, where do you get your protein? So let's talk about protein. And I'm going to tell a story uh, from my pediatric nephrology practice uh, about this four-year-old male that I was consulted on. I'll start by just saying that he had normal growth and development. That's important. And um, he was actually admitted to the hospital where I was working with a skin infection, a very severe skin infection that required IV antibiotics. So he was going to spend a few days in the hospital getting treatment for this skin infection. Part of the history was this mysterious intermittent red rash over his face, neck, ears, and trunk that made him uncomfortable. It wasn't really itchy or painful. The mom would just say that he wasn't acting quite like his usual self when this would happen. And his pediatrician and an allergist were treating with a topical medicine, which seemed to work and make the rash go away. His admission labs were concerning for a serum creatinine of 1.3. So I was consulted and the floor team, the team that was taking care of him with his cellulitis asked me, well, what's going on with his kidneys? Why is his serum creatinine so high? So just a little side note about what creatinine is. It's a muscle metabolite. All of us have muscles. All of us, our muscles make creatinine. This guy can like the rock more and a lot more than a four-year-old boy. Creatinine travels in the bloodstream to the kidneys, and the kidneys clean the blood, filter out the creatinine along with other waste products, which go into the urine and get flushed down the toilet. So when someone has kidney disease, that process is kind of stuck here. Uh, the creatinine is not able to as easily go into the urine, and it builds up in the blood, and that's what was being measured on the blood test. So the question was, what was going on with his kidneys? Why was there so much creatinine in his blood? So I was doing all sorts of tests, and during his stay in the hospital, all the kidney studies were normal and reassuring. And then he left the hospital a few days later with a very normal serum creatinine. And after he left, I was walking down the hall, and all the residents and nurses were giving me high fives and fist pumping me, saying, good job, Dr. NG, you fixed his kidneys. But I, I don't know. I didn't know why his creatinine was high in the first place. I didn't know why it was fixed. Um, so I did what any good doctor would do, and I said, well, why don't we see you back in a few weeks and we'll see what's going on. And strangely enough, when he came back a few weeks later in my clinic, his creatinine was high again, 1.2. So I was asking myself, what's the difference between what's going on in the hospital and at home? Was there something at home? Uh, sometimes there's a medicine, uh, even something as simple as ibuprofen that can cause the creatinine go up. Or was there some environmental exposure at home that uh, would make his serum creatinine go up? But everything, all the usual suspects weren't there. So I had the thought, well, maybe something that was different was the food. So I asked mom to fill out a chronometer diet reader. And the chronometer is a free online program where you can enter the food that you're eating. And I'll give you a breakdown of uh, all, the, all the nutrients you're getting. It's got like 82 micronutrients. So it's very nice, very free, and uh, very helpful. I had mom fill out the diary for a day and send it back to me. So I'm looking at the diary and I was surprised that this four-year-old boy was eating 150 grams per day. That's eight times the recommended daily allowance of protein, which for a four-year-old is only 19 grams. So I asked mom, so, well, what are you doing? How's he getting so much protein? I'm looking at the chronometer and I'm asking mom and it turns out that he really enjoys meat smoothies. Uh, he really enjoys lamb. So mom was mixing him up. Uh, a tremendous amount of meat into these smoothies that he could suck through a straw. I mean, no four-year-old is going to sit there and chew 150 grams of protein every day. I mean, like most four-year-olds, don't, don't they like just grab a French fry off the plate and keep running around? But he was able to eat several meals worth of protein uh, in one of these shakes. And I asked mom, well, why are you doing that? Why are you giving him these, these meat shakes? And mom was really concerned that he get enough protein to grow. And I really, I don't really blame her for this. There's this great urgency in our society these days to get some protein and make sure that you get enough protein. Everyone wants to be adequate in their protein. I mean, you look at uh, the advertising out there. Here's a uh, protein for, let's say, insecure men. Um, here's protein for women. There's protein products that are wrapped in pink. And I don't know if you can see this shampoo, uh, which has bodybuilding protein. I'm not sure if the lady is supposed to drink it or put it in her hair. Get your protein with your coffee, get your protein with your cereal, and of course, get your protein with meat. So um, 
there's this great sense of urgency, but I hope you recognize that this is mostly just like focus groups that the companies use that say that someone's more likely to buy a product uh, if it's advertising how much protein it has. How much protein do we actually need? Well, it was actually figured out in um, with 207 metabolic ward studies. So these are studies where they put a person in the hospital, vary their protein diet, do all sorts of tests, and try to figure out exactly how much protein uh, people need. And they did a lot of tests on those. The absolute minimum is 0.3 grams per kilogram per day. Uh, half the people in the world or in the United States, they will meet their needs with 0.6 grams per kilo per day. So that's about four to 5% of calories, not so much will satisfy half the people's needs. 95% of people will meet their needs with 0.8 grams per kilo per day, which is only eight to 10% of calories. So you end up getting the recommended daily allowance of protein as kind of very reasonable, 19 grams for a eight-year-old, four-year-old, uh, and then adults, you know, 40 to 50, 46 for the women, 52 grams. It's not a lot, especially when you consider based on the survey from about 10 years ago, that people are eating two to three times the amount of protein that they need, or really a tremendous amount of protein. We really don't need to do that much. Now, uh, what if um, someone says, well, I'm really trying to build muscle. Uh, that amount of protein might satisfy 95% of the population, but I'm in the top 5% of the population. I'm hitting the gym hard, and I really want to boost my muscle growth. So um, how much protein would a person need? How much growth can a person expect in, say, one month uh, of muscle with the best workout plan and the uh, best nutrition plan? And full natty, by the way, fully natural, no performance enhancing drugs. It's about a pound of muscle per month a guy can put on in the gym a few hours a week uh, with the ideal program. It's more than that with performance enhancing drugs. But for the typical male, it's about a pound of muscle growth per month. So in nine months, he could put on nine pounds of muscle, right? So what else can someone do in nine months is well, grow a baby. So um, the typical baby in this country is eight pounds and the uterus grows by a pound, pound and a half. So there's your uh, nine pounds of growth. How much protein does a woman need growing a baby? Well, it's been measured at 71 grams per protein per day, which is, again, not a lot, especially when you consider how much uh, protein people are getting in, which takes more protein to build a bicep or to build a baby. I would think a baby. So um, I had a high school football player in my office one day um, saying that his coach insisted that he eat 200 grams of protein per day. And I said, uh, tell your coach you're not pregnant. Uh, those are the people in our society who need the most protein, not you uh, working out a few hours a week playing football. So where do people get their protein? This is an interesting study from um, nutrition studies that broke down plants and animals and equal parts 500 calories of plants, tomatoes, spinach, lima bean, peas, and potato versus 500 calories of beef, beef pork, chicken, and whole milk. And you can see in these columns, um, you don't get any cholesterol when you eat plants. They're only found in animal cells. You get much less fat in the plant products. And look, it's the same amount of protein, 33 grams of protein versus 34 grams of protein. Not a difference. You get plenty of protein eating tomatoes, spinach, lima beans, peas, and potatoes. But look at all the good stuff you also get with the plants. You get a lot more vitamins, beta carotene, fiber. Fiber is short for plant fiber. You only get fiber in plant foods. You don't get it in animal food. So when someone asks me, uh, where do you get your protein? I say, well, from my food. Where do you get your fiber? Uh, if anything, there is a national deficiency of fiber intake. Look at all the other good stuff you get with the plants, vitamin C, uh, folate, vitamin E, iron. Iron is a metal in the ground. The plants absorb it, uh, and then uh, we can eat the plants, or we can let the animals eat the plants. Um, magnesium, and then calcium. Look at how much more calcium is in these plants compared to a glass of whole milk, like twice as much. 
Again, calcium is a rock in the ground and uh, the plants absorb the calcium up through the roots and then we can eat the plants or we can let the animals eat the plants and then eat the animals. Uh, once again, let's just uh, go right to the source. Okay, so back to our four-year-old. Why was his creatinine so high? Well, his muscles were making some creatinine and then the muscles of the animals, when we eat meat, uh, we're eating the muscles of the animals and he was eating so much meat that the creatinine that we were measuring in his bloodstream was not his creatinine, it was the creatinine from the meat that he was eating, from the animal muscles he was eating. His kidneys were perfectly fine, uh, but they were being swamped. His bloodstream was swamped with all the creatinine he absorbed from all that meat he ate. And um, I don't like this term, but when we got him to eat a more balanced diet and not drink those meat smoothies, his creatinine went back to normal. Uh, once a normal amount of creatinine uh, was going into his body. <laughs> so something else uh, I noticed from the chronometer, I really love this program. Again, this isn't a commercial for chronometer. It's just a program that I use and it's free, um, was that he was getting three times the recommended daily allowance of vitamin B3, which is niacin. He was overdosing on niacin and that causes a niacin flush. This is a prickly heat sensation to the face and upper body. It's usually um, 10 to 15, 15 to 30 minutes after intake of a large dose of niacin. Uh, and it's due to localized vasodilation. It's just like a, a blush. Um, the skin blood vessels open up. And it's not an allergic reaction. It happens just about anyone who overdoses on niacin, which is found in the, in the meat again. And it's harmless and usually subsides within one to two hours, which is about the time it took mom to get the uh, ointment prescribed by the allergist and put it on his skin. It was gonna go away anyway. Now it's interesting, sometimes this niacin sneaks into detoxes or cleanses for effect. So you buy the product, you take the product and you feel your skin kind of pringle, tingly uh, and uh, you think, oh, the toxins are leaving my body. This cleanse is really working great, but um, it's not really doing anything. All right, so the lessons we learn from this patient is that right, too much niacin can cause an upper body flush. Really excessive meat intake can give the appearance of kidney failure in a child. Really, there's no need to seek out more protein, even from animal products or protein shakes or protein bars. Um, we can get plenty of protein from the plants that we eat. It's all there in, in the plants. Thank you, Chronometer, for saving the day. And, you know, sometimes hospital food can make a patient better. Uh, hospital food gets a bad rap, but in this particular situation, that was the clue. The difference between uh, what he was eating at home and what he was eating in the hospital, he wasn't eating the milk, the uh, protein shakes, in the, uh, the uh, meat shakes, uh, meat smoothies in the hospital. And that's why his creatinine went down in the hospital, because he was just eating hospital food. Okay. Now let's get back to the recommendations on uh, proper planning uh, for, we're not worried about protein, we're making sure our child's getting enough calories, but let's avoid micronutrient deficiencies. Let me remind you that nearly all vitamins are made by plants absorbing energy from the sun or nutrients from the ground. Uh, the exception is vitamin D. We can make that from the sun ourselves. We don't need the plants. And then vitamin B12, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, but all the other vitamins are made by plants. Let's just eat the plants. Minerals are salts, metals, and trace elements absorbed by plants from the soil and water. As I said before, calcium is a rock in the ground. It goes up through the roots of the plants. Iron is a metal in the ground. It goes up through the roots in the plants. The cow doesn't make uh, calcium to put in its milk. The cow doesn't make the iron to put in its steak. It's getting that from the grass or the corn or the soybeans that are being fed on the factory farms. But let's go right to the source, the plants. Here's a nice table, a nice list of um, notable micronutrients and food sources. Um, I'll leave that up there. You can take a screenshot. You can take out your, cat, your phone and take a picture. And um, you'll see that several plants show up here frequently, like uh, legumes um, and leafy greens, fruits. There are a few where you might want to supplement. Notice omega-3 fats you might want to supplement for those. Iodine. Um, you can use iodized salt in your cooking or supplement if necessary. We'll talk about vitamin B12 next. And then vitamin D, again, you can get that from the sun or from fortified milks. 
but uh, you can certainly get all of your micronutrients that your body needs from plants. Dark chocolate's even on there for iron, very nice. All right, let me talk about vitamin B12 deficiency. It is very serious. Uh, it can cause all of these uh, disease, these symptoms, these diseases, these concerns, and some of these can be permanent even after the vitamin B12 is corrected. Now, why are uh, plant-based eaters at particular risk for vitamin B12 deficiency? It's because it's not found in modern produce. Vitamin B12 is made by soil bacteria and our plants and produce are not getting enough exposure to soil bacteria. For example, they might be grown hydroponically or they're triple washed or um, they're just sterilized before they get to the market. So we're not getting to eat the uh, soil bacteria, for example, or even getting exposed to the soil bacteria. So our produce is too clean, too sterile. Um, however, animals live in the dirt and they eat dirty corn and soybeans that are fed to them. And sometimes they're even supplemented with vitamin B12. So uh, someone who's eating animals will get the B12 from the animals and animal products. But please, um, if you're gonna eat wholly plant-based, think about this vitamin B12 issue. The solution is to take a supplement or to eat fortified foods. Thankfully, um, there are now more widespread plant-based products and the plant-based companies have figured out that this is an NR supplement or product from vitamin for the breastfeeding infant, there is adequate vitamin B12 if mom has enough A, breast milk, and B, enough vitamin B12 in her own body to share with her baby. Um, and it's also in infant formula. The recommended daily allowance for a toddler is 0.9 micrograms per day. That's not a lot. And it can be found in nutritional yeast, uh, which is a favorite of mine. It's a product that you can sprinkle on your foods. Uh, it's kind of cheesy, kind of nutty, uh, good with uh, in so many recipes. There are fortified uh, plant-based milks and some plant-based meat alternatives, cereals, tempeh, and seaweed. And then if you're going to go with supplements for this age group, there are gummies, um, oral dissolving tablets, or sublingual drops. And it's recommended to give 500 micrograms per week, which is like 500 times the recommended daily allowance uh, for a day. But um, some of it's not, most of it's not absorbed. And then you also urinate out any extra that your body's need doesn't need, and there's no risk of an overdose. So uh, you, it's hard to find products that are less than this. And so we're just recommending giving that uh, once per week. Now for the older kids, they need a little more, and it's recommended for them to get in a middle school, elementary school, a thousand micrograms once per week. And then for the teens and adults, 1,250 micrograms once per week, or you can give something like 5,000 micrograms once a month. Uh, again, seems like a large dose compared to what's needed, but your body will take what it needs and uh, urinate out the rest. Now, if you want to get a vitamin B12 level checked with your doctor, also please ask for an MMA level. This is the methyl malonic acid level. This is a precursor, a molecule that's used in the same synthetic pathways as vitamin B12. If you have inadequate vitamin B12, your MMA level will go much too high because the processes, the, the uh, enzymatic synthetic pathways are not using up the MMA. So it's considered a much more sensitive indicator of a vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, you could have a low normal vitamin B12, but if you have a very high MMA level, that would be concerning for a true vitamin B12 deficiency. So please ask for that. Um, it's not always on the tip of someone's mind to order that. Okay, so um, now we're gonna kind of switch gears and I'm gonna talk about some tips to guide young children to eat more plant-based. So this pediatrician that I was working with uh, commented once, he said, you know, um, these parents, uh, when they're weaning their child from the bottle or from the breast, they're always asking me like, what order of foods uh, should I give the, the infant in order to encourage their palate to enjoy fruits and vegetables? Like what, what's the best technique for getting my child to like healthy foods? And this pediatrician was kind of funny. He was like, well, you know, I can give them all the advice, but it's kind of game over when they go to their first birthday party and taste cake and ice cream, because that's going to be the new 
preferred food. So um, here are some tips to hopefully guide your children to eat more plants. Now, some kids might respond well to some of these tips and some kids not so well. You know your child the best. So tip number one I would give is to have fruit everywhere, uh, fruit with meals, uh, fruit on the counter. I like to leave bananas out on the counter because A, I love bananas, my family love bananas, but it's nice when you go in the, in the kitchen, that can be the first thing you see before rummaging through the pantry or through the, the fridge um, just to grab a banana. But um, fruit in lunch boxes, fruit for desserts, uh, fruit everywhere. Also note that grazing is okay. As I said, kids have small stomachs uh, that fill up quickly with the high fiber, high water content of plants and then empty quickly too. So having three large meals a day that adults might do uh, might not be the best fit for a small stomach. So as we're all, if we're gonna be good at herbivores, then uh, grazing is okay. And there's lots of choices. For example, fruit, as I said, uh, carrots and hummus in the summer, fruit juice, popsicles, nuts, toasts, whatever plant-based uh, treat your kid likes is okay when they're grazing. Having your child do age appropriate meal preparation, uh, whether that means shopping for the food or washing the food, measuring the food, working on recipes, mixing, chopping. I don't know if you see this young girl at the top here, she took a, a bite of the cucumber. Um, when they're uh, participating in the fruit preparation, it's a nice chance for them to explore the foods. And then uh, as they are helping, learning about the foods, uh, and it's also easier when you're plant-based because you don't have to worry about uh, contamination from meat products or egg products uh, with the utensils and the cookware and everything. Um, there's much less chance of a foodborne illness. So uh, hopefully they're participating in the meal prep. And when they're done, uh, the sense of pride of having helped will encourage them also to try the food. You know, they say it takes a child maybe eight to 15 times of trying a food before they accept it and, and uh, maybe even like it. So even if the child rejects the plant-based food at the first try, keep trying again, keep offering, and then mix it up recipes. Some kids like sweet, some like salty, some like savory. Uh, there's literally millions of recipes out there in cookbooks and online to try different ways to have your child hopefully at least try and then maybe enjoy and maybe even someday ask, but it's going to take some repetition. We must be good role models for our kids. Uh, here's a nice family enjoying a plant-based dinner of pasta and and uh, and salad. You know, if dad whips out the bacon bits for the salad and mom whips out the meatballs for her own pasta uh, and the kids are denied these uh, very salty, flavorful meat animal products, um, it's going to feel like a punishment uh, that they can't eat what the adults are eating. So as adults and parents, we have to be good ro role models to show how enjoyable it can be to eat plant-based uh, and not have the need for those animal products. This is a, a technique that my parents say worked very well with me when I was a young kid is to offer choices, to give the child a sense of control or the situation, a sense of power. So uh, my parent would say to me, uh, for dinner tonight, we're gonna have corn. Would you like corn on the cob or corn in a bowl? And I'd say one choice or the other. And it, my parents tell me that it made me feel like I was contributing and I was proud and I was more likely to eat uh, based on the choice. Uh, whereas they were still having the control over the situation, getting me to eat corn. So uh, offer choices to your child and have them participate in um, meal selection like that. And hopefully they'll be more likely to try it. And lots of choices. So um, in my household, it's me, my wife, and three teenagers, and they each have their own food preferences. So we kind of have a buffet just about every night of choices for the kids. Um, we do make our own pizzas with various uh, plant-based cheeses and veggie toppings. Uh, make your own burritos with uh, rice and all sorts of ingredients to put in. We make our own veggie sushi with uh, choices of whether it's going to be a cucumber or avocado or sweet potato or peanuts, all the plant kind of stuffings that go into veggie sushi, pasta with um, various uh, top plant-based toppings for the pasta. There's all sorts of um, 
uh, online recipes for bowls of noodles and rice and veggies. But we found that um, if we make one meal for the whole family and one child is uh, very uh, in disagreement with that meal, it can kind of ruin the experience. But this is a nice way to let each child uh, build their own dinner. They're all teenagers now. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a lot happier dinner table when everyone's kind of making their own dinner to their own satisf satisfaction, and it's all plant-based. All right, so the younger kids um, really can enjoy uh, making it silly uh, to eat these foods. Uh, it just takes a, a little bit of extra time to make a little silly uh, kind of treat for them for their meal, and uh, consider that an investment in their health. And um, there again, there's lots of websites and Pinterest page, pages as to how to make your table a little more silly. Another silly thing to do is to have breakfast for dinner, whether that's oatmeal for dinner or um, plant, uh, some, some pancakes or waffles for dinner. Uh, again, the kids will think that's a treat. And speaking of the silly kind of stuff, uh, having the child participate in making food art. Uh, for the younger kids, a lot of exploring a new food is how it feels, uh, how it smells, how it, uh, the, the textures, uh, how it lands on the floor, what kind of sounds it makes. But all that exploring can be done uh, as they create food art. Again, lots of websites uh, about how to do this. And then hopefully it's just a simple next step as to once they've explored this food to actually taste the food. And then the 10th step is, tenth tip is uh, to have a garden. If you have room in your yard for a garden, that's a chance for a child to learn new skills. Some might even say very important skills for life is how to grow your own food. Um, uh, but even if there's not space in a yard, then uh, on a patio or a porch, uh, there are kits that can be bought. You can even buy kits for a windowsill where you can grow microgreens or beans. Uh, you can grow potatoes in a pot. Uh, there's all sorts of options if you have limited space. All you really need is some sunlight. And uh, having the child participate in this food growing, uh, actually there have been studies that show that that makes the child more likely to try that food, but also uh, be more adventurous with foods once they kind of appreciate and know where their foods are coming from. And then here's a little bonus tip. My parents tell me that when I was a toddler, I pointed to my plate and asked, why is this called chicken? And uh, my parents explained to me that the chicken on my plate was the same as the chicken in the farm. And uh, I said, I don't want to eat that anymore. And uh, apparently I was vegan for about a week. Uh, it lasted only a week and uh, it took me about another 40 years to make that connection again. But for the right child, you might consider visiting a farm sanctuary. Uh, and for those of you in New York City, there's a lot right outside of the city in New York, New Jersey. And seeing these animals um, uh, in their farmland and uh, with their personalities. I, when I, I volunteered at a farm sanctuary and, and I visited farm sanctuary, it's always interesting that the, the caregivers describe uh, how intelligent the animals are, the different personalities of the different animals. And I think that can be very powerful for a, a child to see uh, that these sentient beings uh, sharing the planet with us don't belong on our plates. Now, teenagers are a little different. Uh, they're at a developmental stage where they're forming identity. Uh, Risk-taking is more part of their experience. They have less uh, insights into consequences of their actions. And you know, taking care of teenagers for, for 20, 25 years in, in pediatrics, uh, I can't quite say I've met many teenagers who are necessarily concerned about their long-term health, as I've been talking about blood pressure, or things like that. Um, those are very uh, abstract concepts. I mean, um, I turned 50 and I'm still trying to figure out what it's like to be a 50 year old. It's hard for a 15 year old to imagine what it's like. So thinking about health per se might not be at the forefront of a teenager's mind and that's perfectly developmentally appropriate. But um, when trying to encourage a teenager to eat healthier or eat more plant-based, I try to figure out what they are into. So uh, for example, if they're into pop culture, there's a lot of musicians and artists that are plant-based, a lot of actors, 
Like a lot of the Avengers actually are vegetarian or vegan. And a lot of influencers out there who they may connect with uh, and listen to more about the uh, plant-based diet than me. Uh, but if they can um, uh, reach out and, and understand the plant-based diet from the people that they look up to, all the better. Uh, some teenagers are concerned about animal welfare. When we, when my family first went plant-based, actually my my kids were in elementary school, and for my two daughters, it's like, oh, um, they, you know, they had pet animals, and they were like, oh, um, we don't have to eat animals. That's great. We don't want to eat animals anymore if that's an option. So animal welfare certainly makes sense to a lot of teenagers too. And then sports, you know, they're saying that uh, plant-based is the new doping. Like I showed you the uh, top uh, men's tennis players in the world are plant-based and it's coming out that more and more Olympians and NFL players and NBA players are going plant-based and, and seeing a lot of benefits in their athletic performance. And there's even a documentary called Game Changers, which uh, interviews some of these athletes. So for the athlete, uh, there's that angle. And then teenagers are very uh, concerned about the environment. Um, I had one young woman who was spending her weekends cleaning up the parks uh, with a group. And I said, well, you know, it's great that you're acting locally like that. Let's talk globally about how the food you eat affect the environment. And uh, so there's lots of documentaries and um, information out there about how the plant-based diet reduces the carbon footprint, water usage, land usage, things like that. And this is a actually uh, a long-term uh, issue that teenagers are, are very involved with and are thinking about. So if I can work that in the conversation. And teens are really into cooking and uh, maybe like the of new plant peas and uh, swap eggs or, or dairy in the cooking. And that could be a fun challenge for them if they're already into cooking. So um, yeah, the teenagers also, uh, I encourage to check out the documentaries. Uh, they're very visual and, and full of good stories uh, regarding all of these issues. So thanks a lot for your attention. I am, as said, Dr. Herbivore. You can check out my website. There's a QR code to my website. I have a telemedicine practice in New York and New Jersey. And um, also on my website, you can find links to e-courses that I provide uh, trying to help families thrive. So thanks a lot for your attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions now. All right, and I will come back on camera just momentarily, just having a technical issue here, but we'll start in the meantime with our first question. Um, and thank you so much for, for all of that, Dr. Edinger, that was wonderful. Um, so someone has a six-year-old daughter with an almost vegetarian diet, and the doctor wanted to do blood work to ensure that she's not low in iron, and she was not low in iron, so that's great. Um, just wondering if you have any further suggestions of plant-based foods that are a good source of iron. I know that was a slide, um, but if you have any other creative suggestions, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, let me see if I can go, I can go back to that slide if I can, because there, there might be several questions about this. Yeah, and even, um, you know, even a, a quick search can help find such things. But for iron, the legumes, leafy greens, soybeans, soy foods, quinoa, potatoes, dried fruit, dark chocolate, uh, tahini. Um, actually, I made, I found a great uh, tahini smoothie recipe. It's a uh, tahini dates, uh, plant-based milk and ice cubes, and it's amazing. I've been making it a lot. Um, seeds uh, and sea vegetables. Uh, and then there's also iron supplements. You know, um, I, a lot of people tell me, oh, their, their pediatrician says they need to eat meat for the iron. But, uh, but no, I mean, there's all these great plant products. And then really, if you're really struggling to get these iron-containing foods in, um, there are iron drops and, and uh, iron supplements. I and mean, we, we have the knowledge we don't need to go uh, to the, always to the meats to fulfill these uh, concerns. Thank you. Next question is, how much soy protein is okay for children and adults? Oh, so there are concerns about soy, um, perhaps, uh, contributing to the growth of hormonal cancers. But from what I've learned and uh, researching that, 
is that it's been pretty much debunked. And I recommend um, Nutrition Facts uh, by Dr. Greger is a great resource. Um, there's hundreds of hours of brief little videos that cover such topics, like what about soy, what about um, iodine, things like that. So that can be a great resource for you. But um, again, I don't think anyone really needs to be going out of their way to get protein. Uh, there's plenty of protein in the plants, as I showed you. Um, just try to get people to not worry so much about protein. I mean, we have an obesity epidemic going on in this country. We don't have a protein deficiency epidemic. Everyone's getting plenty of protein uh, without having to go out of their way. So. All right, next question is, um, some had some questions or thoughts on meals like pasta not necessarily being healthy or perceived as, as healthy because of the release of sugar after you eat them. So just curious if you have thoughts, solutions, or substitutes for that. Mm -hmm. I love sugar. Uh, sugar is what fuels uh, all of the cells in our body. I want my families that are plant-based to be full of energy. I want them to get a good amount of sugar and we need and, uh, sugar for energy. So there's a great fear that sugar causes obesity, that sugar causes diabetes, but um, that's a whole nother half hour talk where I can uh, demonstrate to you that that's not actually true. The sugar that's in the pasta, uh, which is actually a minimally, minimally processed plant product, and the sugar that's in all of these plant products uh, is released slowly with the fiber and the water and um, comes packaged with antioxidants and polyphenols and all this other good stuff in the plant package that I don't worry so much about sugar as uh, a lot of people do. Uh, see, I think there's a big disconnect in this country. Everyone's worried about protein, but they're getting enough protein. Um, every, people are worried about sugar. Uh, I think people do fine with sugar, the real uh, cause of a lot of our uh, epidemics going on right now is uh, actually the fat that's in the food. And when you're eating plant-based, you're on a lower fat diet. Um, all the benefits of the quote unquote low carb diet, you actually get with the plant-based diet because it is a low carb, it's a low added sugar diet. Um, added sugar is some of the danger, but the sugar that you're finding in the fruits and in these plants is actually uh, the sugar you need, your, your cells need and want. Yeah, and I noticed that with your suggestion of having fruits in, in you know, everywhere, every time kind of meal, I think some people might be surprised by that advice, um, but those are the good sugars. Yeah, I'll give you resources. So Dr. Neil Bernard wrote a book about this. I forget the name of the book. Um, but there's also another uh, book called Mastering Diabetes, which was written by two uh, nutritionists. And it's really... Um, it debunks this whole fear of sugar. And um, I could go on and on. That's like a whole, book me for a whole nother hour because I, I can talk about that. But um, actually um, one, of, one, of my, um, one of my e courses, I, I'm board certified in obesity medicine also. Um, and one of my e courses is specifically about um, families that are struggling with a child's weight and how to address that weight concern with a plant-based diet. And I have a lesson in there uh, several lessons in there about this fear of sugar and um, how it's not, that's the fear, the fear shouldn't be there. Um, the real fear is in the fat that uh, causes the obesity and causes the uh, diabetes. And uh, I show the evidence, but uh, those are the other resources I recommend, Dr. Bernard and uh, Mastering Diabetes. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. So can you talk a bit, we, the word vegan came up a lot in this talk. So can you talk a bit more about the reasons to stay away from dairy? Oh, the reason, uh, the, can, was that was that one question or two <laughs> questions, the vegan? Well, yeah, just, just if you can speak to, you know, a little bit more about the adverse health effects of having dairy. Of dairy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, it's kind of funny that we have this term lactose intolerant. Um, it's, it's a weird term because it's thought that 68% of the world has um, this lactose intolerant that after they're weaned from breast milk, they're no longer able to tolerate um, milk, but like it's cow's milk. Why are we eating cow's milk? And, you know, it, it's weird to call it intolerance, like something that we probably shouldn't be eating it anyway, that um, 
most of the world is lactose intolerant. So I had an interesting experience when I was um, with my, one of my daughters at a Thai restaurant and a dish came out that looked like it had yogurt on it. And I asked the waiter, I said, oh, you know, is, is this dairy, is this yogurt? And the waiter said, no, um, in my country, everyone's lactose intolerant. We don't have any dairy in any of our dishes on our menu, just not something that we eat. So you think about it, there are whole countries in Asia and in Africa, especially where the pediatricians tell the families, don't give your kids dairy, it'll make them sick. It'll cause upset stomach and, and uh, make them ill. So, you know, in the rest of the world, they're av avoiding dairy. And there are observational studies that actually, um, they have less chance of hip fracture, people who are lactose intolerant. They're, they're not, you know, we're told to drink milk, so we have strong bones, but yet the people who aren't drinking milk are the ones who have less chance of hip fracture. So um, again, that's a whole nother long story that uh, is in one of my e-courses. But uh, I'll, I'll add another thing is that there is this uh, this uh, additional aspect to the vegan movement coming from the African-American community. And they're saying it's actually racial injustice that milk is being forced on their kids in schools, that uh, their often their children are lactose intolerant and the only option they have is the milk and the cheese. And uh, that might be making their kids sick at school and less able to perform well in school when they have upset stomachs. So there's this whole movement coming out. Dr. Milton Mills is a doctor and he's got several YouTube videos about this, uh, an issue we should be aware of that. Why are we giving uh, dairy or only having that option to kids who are gonna be sick from that and not feel well from that? So there's this whole other issue, a lot, lots of other issues going on about dairy. And it's so bad for the environment, uh, all the uh, the dairy cows that are kept alive, taking up a lot of land, eating a lot of food, drinking a lot of water. Yeah, lots of issues. So I would I would suggest going to the website Switch for Good. Uh, they're a nonprofit who's trying to get people to recognize the um, problems of dairy. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, we are about to wrap up. We have one last question which you may have addressed a little bit earlier on in, in the talk, but um, tell us a little bit more about, do you need to fill your plate much more with a plant-based diet to feel full? Meaning if you're having a salad, but you don't have that piece of chicken on top or that piece of salmon, do you need to go for that extra scoop of spinach um, mm -hmm. to make sure that you feel satisfied at the end of that meal? Uh, yes, yes. Um, a lot of times when people go plant-based, they all of a sudden, they, they find they're feeling more hungry. And it's because you, you know, you're up here with the salt, sugar, and fat of the standard of American diet, and you've gone down to here with the plant-based diet, and your body says, oh, there's a famine approaching. I need to start packing on the on the pounds. I need to eat more. Your body recognizes that that deficit that's developed. And so, yeah, you you when people go plant-based, also um, the microbiome, the bacteria that's in our guts that's uh, got to break down more of the fiber that's going in there now. So yeah, there can be some strange sensations uh, when you first go plant-based, but yes, you definitely need to eat more volume. And this, this is one of the benefits of the plant-based diet is that so many diets, if someone's especially trying to lose weight, it's very portion controlled and portion restricted. Um, but when you cross over onto the, that spectrum, onto that, um, uh, let me see if I can get back to the, um, left side of that spectrum of calorie density, then all of a sudden you're just going to be too calorie deficient if you don't eat enough volume. Uh, you definitely want to be kind of in this range, filling up on starches. They can provide you um, a good amount of fiber, a good amount of fillingness, potatoes, whole grains, things like that. Um, so rather than putting chicken or cheese on your sandwich, on your salad, um, putting beans, um, having whole grain bread with a salad, things like that, or avocado, nuts on the salad. The, um, people tend to thrive in this area, right? Like in the 500 to 600 calorie density area, that's going to give you uh, plenty of fullness and plenty of energy uh, so that you can go about your day and really thrive. You don't want to be too far to the left. Even another handful of spinach is only going to give you uh, 50, you know, 70 calories. So I really want the families that I work with to go out and be good examples of the plant-based living, uh, you know, 
going and running marathons and doing well in school and everything like that, that uh, once your body starts to feel good with this high octane fuel uh, to really uh, show others what, what it's like to be plant-based and how to thrive. Excellent. Well, um, Dr. Ettinger, if you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen at this point. Um, I want to thank everyone for um, attending this talk this evening. Um, before we go, you mentioned a smoothie recipe. I want to <laughs> make sure everybody walks away with that, those details in case they want to wake up tomorrow morning right. or go to the store and get the ingredients to try it. Yeah, let me, uh, let me, I got to pull it up on my phone. I think you said tahini yeah. and dates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's uh, two tablespoons of tahini. Get get the good stuff, not the cheap tahini. <laughs> um, two, two tablespoons of tahini, two dates, a half cup of plant milk, and a dash of cinnamon, and then um, a half to one cup of ice. So um, you might need to vary, depending on how thick or, or drink-like you want it, you might vary the amount of plant milk or the ice. But oh yeah, it's 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 really good. It sounds amazing. And just because we have an extra minute, did you want to take a minute to just let everyone know about the two day course that you'll be running at the ninety second Street Y in April? Right. Yeah. So um, I'm afraid I don't have the dates on the tip of my mind. I hope you can help it's me with that. It's the and twenty sixth. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna go a deeper dive into the plant based diet for families, and I'm gonna show you how to use chronometer. There's um, a bunch of tutorials out there online about how to use chronometer, but they're all geared for adults. Uh, and there's only, there's one that's geared for um, plant-based people, but again, for adults. And uh, so actually in my e-course, I have a, a tutorial for plant-based uh, for plant-based families for the kids. And it's a little different, a little tricky to use, especially um, when you're not used to it. So um, we're going to do five engineering plant -based and I'm going to teach you how to use the chronometer and then send you out to do a day's worth of a diary uh, with the chronometer. And then as a group, we'll all come back in uh, and go over each other's results and kind of learn um, if someone's a little low on this or a little too much of that. Often when I, when I do this, parents are surprised that um, their child's getting so much, uh, you know, too much of this or too much. It's like, in the society, we're like, oh, we got to get vitamins. Oh, we got to get protein. But when you actually break it down and look, so that's often uh, the outcome. But we'll go over the chronometer results. And I'm also going to show you how to use artificial intelligence. Uh, there's some new artificial intelligence programs out there in order to fine tune and kind of tweak uh, the uh, recipes and uh, so that you can meet your kids' needs for nutrition. So those are the two-day the two day program that we're going to do together at the 92nd Street Y. Fantastic. We're looking forward to it. So um, any other questions that came in a little bit later, I have written those down. So I'll make sure to ask Dr. Ettinger. And when I send out the recording of this event, um, which we have been recording, and I'll send that out, I'll, may, I'll be sure to wrap up those questions. So um, Dr. Ettinger, I want to thank you for your time this evening. And thank you to everybody for joining us. And I hope we'll see you tomorrow evening for our 7pm event as well. And um, stay well and enjoy making plant-based recipes. All right. Especially that smoothie. That sounds yes, good. Yes, yes. It's a hit. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Good night.